Michael, you mentioned Somalia, and these are the words that were used to describe it for decades. Famine, civil war, Black Hawk Down, failed state, al-Shabaab. So what does this mean for this country that has been defined by so many negative words for decades to pull off a summit like this? Yeah, I think images of war-torn Somalia are slightly outdated. If you were to see daily life in Mogadishu, the capital today, you would see bustling markets and bounding construction, uh, funded in part by returning diaspora, partially by foreign countries. Um, we'll have to speak about both threats and promises, but I think on balance, the EGAD summit today, followed by uh, elections uh, later this month and in October, uh, should sound an optimistic note for Somalia and its people. Well, kind of riffing off of that, uh, the foreign affairs minister noted in this quote, uh, this is the first time Somalia hosts such a high-level summit in 30 years. We see it as a historic signal and message to the world that Somalia is coming back. Is it really coming back, or is it still fragile? Well, it's certainly a pivotal and historic moment for Somalia, but not to dispense with the optimism too quickly, but it faces a number of uh, serious threats, uh, particularly outside the capital, um, and chief among them is security. That's the reason, for instance, that today's summit was only held in the green zone uh, near Mogadishu's airport, because, and there were still reports of uh, gunfire in other parts of the capital. The chief threat comes from al-Shabaab, uh, which technically retreated from Mogadishu back in 2011, but simply shifted from uh, conventional warfare tactics to guerrilla warfare targeting the African Union, which went from being peacekeepers in Somalia to targets themselves to symbols of daily life. So it's certainly um, in a fragile state still. So how does the country turn the corner? Well, there's... Um, a number of challenges that Somalia faces, I'd say uh, there are three chief among them. Uh, firstly, security we talked about. They're going to have to bring security not just to the capital, but nationwide uh, to defeat al-Shabaab and strengthen a Somali national military to eventually take over that responsibility from the African Union. Second is politically. Um, these elections are not the finish line. They're just a hurdle in Somalia's political development. They have to see if they can bring former warlords um, and tribal leaders into the political process. There has to be respect for um, a civilian government. For instance, will President Hassan step down if he loses the election? Um, and uh, those will have to go peacefully. Now, they're not being held nationwide. There's only about 14,000 designated voters because that would be too dangerous otherwise. And uh, lastly, economic. Uh, rebuilding Somalia is going to take a lot of investment and patience. Some of that will come from returning diaspora. Others will come from foreign countries looking to cash in on that peace dividend now that security improves um, in uh, the heart of the country. Turkey has become a very important economic partner looking to cash in on that dividend in ways that China um, is looking for its returns in formerly war-torn countries such as DRC and Sudan proper. Michael Klein with Analysis Force. Thanks so much. You're welcome, Michael Klein Mike. is a senior analyst for Drum Cusack, the firm specializing in risk assessment. How much is fact and how much is fiction? Suicide bombings have increased in the past month because Boko Haram is shifting to more traditional terrorist tactics as they've been routed out of the territory that they held by the counterinsurgency. As they do that, they uh, shift towards suicide bombings and ambushes. It's true that a lot of these suicide bombings are reported to be young girls. That's been a really troubling legacy of the Chibok, um kidnapping. Is this a case where Boko Haram is that strong? or Nigeria is just that weak? I think the key word here is strategy. Boko Haram has a strategy. It's been portrayed as a ragtag group of gunmen, but they are very adaptable. The question is, does the government have a strategy? The colossus of the Nigerian government, not adaptable. They haven't been able to adapt their conventional warfare approach to the asymmetric and uh, terroristic suicide bombings and attacks that Boko Haram can uh, uh, use as it shifts into the It is a sign that maybe they have not been as decimated as people thought. There are three at least real reasons why we see the sudden escalation. One is that there's a new president in town and they want to hit him hard before he can stand up. Two, they've adapted their strategy um, to the conventional counterinsurgency um, techniques of uh, the government to uh, retreat from holding territory 
towards more asymmetric warfare that relies on sleeper terror cells, more in the, more, the model of Al-Qaeda. The third uh, reason is that we're in the middle of the holy month of Ramadan, and that is actually an ISIL prerogative. Okay, so what are the implications of his win on Nigeria's two militant movements, Boko Haram in the north and the Niger Delta media, uh, militancy in the south? Right. So the, Nigeria basically has two historic militant movements. One everyone knows about right now is Boko Haram, that's which is raging in the northeast of the country, um, the region uh, where Bihari himself is from. And there's also a latent Niger Delta militancy, which people might remember more from the early 2000s. A lot of the disbanded militant groups uh, in the south have threatened to take to the streets or produce more unrest or violence um, in protest of Bihari's candidacy. But I think ultimately we believe that the leaders of those militant groups will be waiting to see what concessions they can get from a new Bihari administration um, before making more attacks. After all, the president that originally took the brought the Niger Delta militancy under control was the former president Yardwa, who was a Muslim from the same northern region as Bihari. Defeat an incumbent. So, what does that say about Nigeria's population, its voters, and and how their views may have changed dramatically? And, and how has he been able to shed his past as a military ruler? It's a major sign of Nigeria's uh, maturity as a democracy, um, how far it's come just from 1997 when multi-party elections began. Like I said, I think the greatest impact that Bihari has had so far was his election. It's pro his election did more to instill confidence and unite the country than probably anything in the past 18 years. Uh, Nigeria is an extraordinarily young country. Seventy percent of its population is under the age of 30. So uh, starting or getting off on the right foot now in 2015 could mean a lot for its own political development. The influence um, is going to stay the same. In fact, it's spreading just from the economic model that I was just alluding to, to political, uh, where China is getting involved in building political capacity with African nations to security and, and being involved in peacekeeping operations. Um, but it is, go and, and in those instances, actually, you see somewhat that it's a two-way um, uh, influence, although it's heavily weighted on one end. Um, you see China, uh, you know, delving into um, certain doctrines that it would never explore um, internally or in the Asian sphere. As we see certain African countries who have grown commodity dependent on their relationship with China really crash economically. But there's still a lot of um, room to uh, be made in terms of major infrastructure development projects like this in, uh, information superhighway. And that still has um, some very positive influence potential um, with driving wages and uh, capacity and kind of higher value investment up in Africa itself. Michael Klein joining us from New York City. Thank you. For more on the Chibuk Girls, I'm joined from New York by international security professional Michael Klein. He's also a specialist on issues facing Africa. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you, Elaine. What kind of impact can this new video of the girls have on the negotiations between Nigeria's government and Boko Haram? I think it was meant both as a proof of life video to sustain those negotiations and also as a media tool showing that Boko Haram, since its affiliation with the Islamic State or ISIS, has grown more media savvy. While it was shot in December, they chose to release it today, two years after the original abduction. Um, while uh, there's a long history of ransom negotiations and criminal kidnappings in Nigeria, this type of large-scale terrorist kidnapping is a different beast entirely. And with the country or with Bihari's government winning the ground war and the more conventional battle against Boko Haram. I personally don't see um, them moving ahead with some sort of ransom negotiation or prisoner swap. That would have been more likely a year ago when they were losing the war under the previous administration. But it does give a lot of hope to those families that at least some or may hopefully most of their children are still alive. Um, but it's a somber reminder of what happened two years ago and how far we have to come. Well, I want to get to Bihari in just a moment. But as you mentioned, it has been two years. And so many people around the world want to know why there hasn't been any more progress in the case. You know, more than 200 girls. It was just an astounding number then, and it still remains now. There has been a lot of what we call conventional counterterrorism progress on the ground, routing Boko Haram out of its former strongholds. 
but the group has instead uh, just turned to its original kind of guerrilla tactics of hit and run attacks and using, using suicide bombers. And this is another really troubling legacy of the, Bo of the Chibok kidnapping, is that a lot of the suicide bombers in Nigeria and especially lately in northern Cameroon have been young women, um, probably kidnapped victims themselves. There was a lot of hope Nigeria's new president, Mohamedou Buhari, would make some headway after good luck, Jonathan. But, you know, he's actually been in China during this anniversary. So is this simply not a priority for Nigeria's government? He would certainly say that it is a priority. And he's said over um, a couple of times that the Boko Haram group has been defeated from posing an existential threat to the Nigerian state to um, a, a much smaller scale problem. But try telling that to the families of the Chibok girls or the thousands of people who have been killed. He, since the beginning, has approached um, this on the diplomatic front, uh, trying to forge a multinational task force among the four Lake Chad Basin countries to fight Boko Haram. And something like that does need Western and um, even Chinese backing, if he can garner that through talks. Um, but there are many people in Nigeria who say that in his diplomatic um, uh, prowess, he has forgotten some of the problems on the ground.